Let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As we turn there, we're right in the middle, starting last Sunday on Mother's Day, continuing uh, through actually till Father's Day, looking at the, the biblically defined character qualities that God wants in godly men and women, godly husbands and wives, and godly children living at home. We're just looking progressively at those. And so sometimes it's important, right now we're right in the middle of looking at the wives and mothers part, to back up and think about where what we're talking about as far as the specifics of what God expects in marriage and in parenting from women, where that fits in the, the overall picture of everything that God is doing. And and that's that's critical lest we get all worn down in, in, in thinking about the day-to-day details. So, so what I mean by that is that the Bible was written to be profitable to Christ's church. And all of us should regularly pause from time to time and look beyond our niche, whatever your, your spiritual gifted uh, and, and gifting blend is in your life, to look beyond the niche of what we're doing in Christ's church and see the grand view of all that he is doing in and through us. That's why all of us have sacrificed another hour plus, another 75 minutes, to be reminded this morning of of the bigger picture. Each of us have a spirit-implanted desire to be a good and faithful servant to God. And each of us want to do our part for the glory of God. But the big picture is this. This morning, when you and I were saved, we entered into a partnership with God. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. God's grace means that he has partnered with us to make sure that everything that he has told us that he wants us to do. And by the way, do you know what an imperative is? A command in the scripture in the New Testament is filled with commands, imperatives. Do you know what those are? It's when God asks us to behave in a way that's contrary to the way we naturally would. When he asks us to act in an impossible way that is foreign and strange and different than the world, he gives us the power to do it. It's called his grace. So think about that, that God wants us to do a partnership with him. And today, you and I, as we sit here this morning, are part of something big, something grand, and something that dwarfs even all of our exciting summer vacation plans. Whatever they might be. Someone told me once uh, uh, last year, they said, you know, you're never more than three miles from water here in Michigan. You know, it's the water winter wonderland. And I said, well, that's strange. I'm never more than about 10 feet from water in our house. Uh, You know, there are faucets everywhere. They said, no, no, lakes, lakes and ponds and everything. And I said, I see. Well, the big picture that's even more exciting than our summer vacation plans or something that will dwarf the harsh realities of life that sometimes consume us. I mean, either you're thinking about exciting things in the future or you're being worn down by the struggles of life. Struggles like our broken down cars or our house that's wearing out or our lost job or our bad health or work pressures or social problems or even personal loneliness. You know, some people are crippled by besetting Loneliness, And they forget that loneliness is when God takes everyone and everything else out of our life so he can be the closest to us. I mean, few of us remember that. Next time you have a pang of loneliness, say, where are you, Lord? You want to be closest to me? I, <laughs> I need to realize that. But this morning, through Jesus Christ, you and I are part of what God has chosen as his priority in the whole universe. Do you know why you're sitting here this morning? Because the Lord said every one of his children that were purchased by Christ's blood, that great shepherd of the sheep who bought us with his own blood, that we are to become having a custom, a habit in our life of gathering together on the first day of the week. Remember very early on the first day of the week, the disciples ran to the tomb and they discovered it was empty and the Lord revealed himself and showed himself to them. And that first day of the week became forever a memorial that Jesus Christ was the firstborn from the dead. So do you know what Sunday really is? It's a weekly celebration of Christ's birthday, his birth as the firstborn from the dead. We gather to remember Christ who rose, who brought with us for us, 
His forgiveness and our healing of our sin-sick souls. That's what we celebrate on the first day of the week. But as we gather, we have something to do. We are to be reminded from His Word we're in partnership with God. Think of that. You and I are, remember Paul called us joint heirs? Do you know what that means? We're in partnership with God. We have an equity stake in something that will never end, never fail, never decay. We are a vital part of Christ's church. So sitting here this morning, you are, if you're born again, a vital part of God's priority in this universe. You know, a priority is something people focus on. You know, if their priority is the lake house, they're always focusing on it. If their priority is the boat, they're always focusing on it. If their priority is their workshop, they're always focusing on it. If their priority is golf, they're always focusing on it. I mean, if their priority is work, they're always working. You know what God's priority is, where His attention is? It's on us, on His church. God's plan is to work in this world through His church. And so we need to remind ourselves of that by looking at what it is that God wants for us to do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and if you haven't found 1 Thessalonians yet, it's uh, the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then all those epistles, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. There it is, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And what I want to do is I want to show you three words that summarize our purpose in life. And, and for some of you, it, this is brand new, and for most of you, it's just review. But God says, first of all, he wants us to realize that our purpose in life is that we have a mission. And everything we do in life is encompassed in this mission. And that's what Paul summarized in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 1. And he said then, verse 1, Finally then, brethren, so he's talking to Christians, brethren, code for believers, Christians. Now look at all these words he piles on before he says anything. I'll keep reading and then I'll, I'll point out what he says. But this is so important, he really framed it. It's kind of like when you go to you know, Hobby Lobby, and you have this little picture, and they keep putting mat and frame and frame and frame because the picture is real important. Well, he's really mad at this. Look what he says. He says, Finally then, brethren, we urge, we exhort you in the Lord that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us. Now, that is all matting and frame. He hasn't said anything yet. And this is what he's saying. You ought to walk to please God. That's the center of this whole mission statement. Our mission in life is to walk through life. Are you a nurse? You're supposed to do your nursing work pleasing to God. Are you a teacher? You're supposed to teach in such a way it pleases God. Are you a student? You're supposed to study in such a way that pleases God. Are you a mechanic? You are to be a mechanic that does your mechanical work in such a way that it pleases God. It was such a simple, for everybody in the first century, they knew exactly what they were doing. They had a mission in life. And their mission was that God was their master and that they were called to go through life at whatever they did, looking up and knowing it was pleasing Him. And if it wasn't, they immediately repented of it and said, I don't want anything to do with that because it doesn't please you. That's a simple way of going through life. No matter what you do. I, I meet people, I always ask people all the time, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? In fact, I ask little children, I say, oh, what are you going to be when you grow up? And you know what they always say? Well, I'm not sure I want to be you know, a fireman or a doctor or a jet pilot or something like that. Or some of them say, I don't know. And I said, well, you know what you should say? I don't know exactly what I will do to earn an income. But I do know one thing. I am going to serve God. I'm going to do His will. I want to please him. So number one, and if you're a Bible writer, I actually have written in my Bible, right by 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, mission. My mission is to please God. You know, I mark in my Bible because I learned as a little boy, I used to, when I was tall enough to see over the grass, my dad would let me go with him. And, and he led expeditions up in, in northern Ontario, just south of James Bay, up in the Chapelo area of, of Canada. And, and my dad had this habit that he would mark the trail so he could see where he came from. He would put a mark where he was, and then he would go to another point that he would look at where he could see that mark, this mark, and that mark. And he always had this constant trail marking going on because he took groups way in where you could only get except with airplane drop-offs. And so he had to mark the trail. 
And, and that habit of him always knowing where he's been and, and where he's going and where he was, I began to do that in my Bible. I mark it a lot to see what I've learned and what I'm learning and in the future to remind myself of where I've been. So Bible marking is very profitable. It just causes you to keep on that trail. So number one, we have a mission to please glorify and serve and live for God. Now turn back to Acts. So we're backing through the Bible this time. Acts chapter 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, chapter 20. Because as we are on this lifelong mission to, to glorify, please, uh, serve God, that's our mission, we also, secondly, have a message. So everybody on this mission, we all have the same mission, and we all have the same message. And that's what Paul emphasizes. Our mission is accomplished by the proclamation of a message. And Paul summarized that message in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24 as the gospel of grace, the good news of grace, the gospel of grace. And this is what he says in verse 24 of Acts 20. He said, but none of these things move me. None of what things? All the struggles I've been through, all the troubles, all the persecution, hardship and deprivation. None of that stuff moves me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. I'm not grasping on life. I'm not worried about exhausting and expending myself. Why? So that I may finish my race with joy. Oh. The ministry I received. See, he realized he was on this mission that we've already talked about. But as he was on that mission to finish his race with joy and the ministry he received from the Lord, this is what he's supposed to do. Here's his message. Look at the end of verse 24. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now, I was thinking of filing a discrimination suit against American Airlines because they don't like to fly into Kalamazoo. Did you all know that? They go out of their way to not fly into Kalamazoo. And so I was sitting on one of the endless flights that I was on the last two days, and, and they didn't want to go into Kalamazoo for some reason, so we had to reroute all the over through Dallas and everything else. It was very funny. But all that to tell you that I was sitting, and my Bible is starting to fall apart. The cover is totally coming off, and I know it's going to fall right apart. And so I decided I'd buy another exact copy. And I was sitting with my little tray table down in that airplane with my old falling apart Bible and my new Bible. And I had my mark on my hand. I was going like this, and I was marking. And, you know, everybody was doing their own thing, whatever you do on airplanes, you know, playing with the bags and reading the magazines and everything in the seat pockets. And I was doing my thing. And all of a sudden, I distinctly felt someone was watching me. You know, being in a terrorist, you know, society, I thought, wonder what's going on. And I went like this and I looked over my shoulder and there was this stately steward. Steward is a male stewardess, you know, and he had white hair and that little, you know, the whole outfit on. And he was standing like this, looking over the seat at me. And no one paid any attention because stewards are all over the airplane. But then he said out loud, what are you doing? Well, immediately, you know, everyone thought I was lighting my shoe or something, you know. <laughs> they thought I was the shoe bomber. And so immediately, 18 sets of eyes, three in front of me, three beside me, three here, three here, three behind me. Everyone just looked to see what I was doing. And I thought, oh, this is great. I have a little congregation in the sky. And um, I said, I'm, I'm marking my Bible. And he said, you have two of them. He said, why do you have two of them and why is there writing in them? And he says, what are you doing? Well, I had the complete attention of everyone that was within earshot. So I said, well, uh, what would you like to know? He says, well, tell me one thing you found in the Bible. So he asked me to speak. See, you know, the best way to witness is have someone ask you and in front of a group of people. And everyone was just focused. And I said, OK, I said, well, and, you know, I write stuff in my Bible and it just happened. I was right there in, in Hebrews and I said, OK, I'll read to you what I have written in my Bible. This is what I had written in my Bible. I said, God did everything possible to be done so that you can come to him merely by faith. And I, I looked up at him and I said, God wants to forgive all of your sins forever. And there was this uncomfortable silence. 18 sets of eyes went right back to the seat pockets and he just smiled, went like this and walked to the back of the plane and sat down in that little pull down seat. And I thought, you know, 
the Lord was working. So I kept underlining and everything, and then I got up because you know, you're supposed to walk around and not get slobitis or whatever you get, you know, from sitting too long. So I just wandered back, you know, just to see if he wanted to talk anymore. And I got to the very back, and he was digging through his little steward bag, and he pulled out this little Roman Catholic Bible. And had all these beads, you know, between the pages. And he had little pictures of saints and Mary. And and he held that up and he said, is this a good Bible? I said, oh, that's a that's a good Bible. I looked at the, you know, it was a it was a Roman Catholic Douay imprimatur Bible. And I flipped. I said, yeah, I said, yeah, that's a Bible. I says has some parts that aren't really the Bible, but it doesn't matter. I said, uh, I said, but that's the Bible. I said, and he said. How could I find something like you just found in my Bible? So sweet. And I stood there in the back with him. And, you know, he, he went, dug in his little bag some more, and he pulled out this little notebook, and he, he said, I want a Bible like yours. He said, because mine I don't get anything out of. And I thought, oh, it's not the Bible, sir. It's the author. But to make a long story short, I shared the gospel with him, and he wrote down everything I said, and, and he said, tell me one book other than the Bible I could read that would help me become like, like you are. And I said, okay. And I I wrote down, I told him, I said, here's a book you should buy. And I can just see him wherever he landed, you know, going to the bookstore with his little notebook saying, I want this because I want to be, you know. And and I thought, Acts 20.24, we are to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel is the message of an endless source of divine energy for abundant living that God wants to forgive all of your sins forever. And he wants to move in and give you the strength to live an impossible life. Now, We all have a mission. We're supposed to please God. Whether we're on an airplane, sitting in your car, at work, at home, all alone, on a business trip, going to school, or your summer vacation plans. We have a mission. We have a message. And that message is we are to testify to this gospel. But the third M, mission, message, the third M is that there is a method that God has and that takes us to our text this morning. I knew you knew I'd get there. Titus chapter 2, okay? I want That is God's method. The method that God has for us, our collective purpose in life, is that he has a method to cause this mission to grow, this message to get out, and that is for those that know Christ, those who are already embracing him, they know the message of the gospel, they know their mission, the method is they're supposed to get next to someone else. Now, if you want to know what Jesus is going to look you in the eye and ask you whether or not you did it, if you want to know what he's going to check on when you someday at your funeral, they're singing, blessed be the name of the Lord, you're in heaven. And when you finally get there and look at him, he's going to ask you if you are a good and faithful servant. What does a servant do? A servant does the will of someone else. So we have a choice whose will we're going to do. God's will is that we follow his method for causing Christ's church to go forward in this world. And this is what he says. God's plan in Titus 2 is that his work in the world is his church, and his church can be described as a group of people who are in partnership with God, who God gives his his grace to so they can do the impossible to glorify him. Now, how do you change people that don't even know why they're here and people that don't even know how to express that message into those that are completely understanding their mission in life and they're walking around giving this message out? How do you do that? God says, this is my method. I get someone else that's just one step down the road further than them to put them in tow and to say to them, hey, are you reading the Bible? You know how I read the Bible? Hey, have you ever memorized a verse? Do you know what verses I've memorized? Hey, have you ever shared the gospel? No? Well, you know what? I'm going to do it right now. Why don't you come with me? I'll show you how. That's how God's method of causing His church to go forward took place in the first century. And by the way, you don't need a manual. You don't need a video. You don't need to go somewhere. All it is is personally knowing your mission in life and having that message understood inside and then bringing someone along with you and show them what you learn. And that's what Titus 2 is all about. 
And these new believers that were fresh out of paganism had to be coached. They had to be trained. They had to have modeling. Do you know what's so amazing? We are like all of us are in brain surgery school. This is like brain surgery school. How would you like to be a neurosurgeon and come to medical school? And what I say is, hey, there are no attendance requirements. Hey, you don't even have to buy the textbook. In fact, you never have to do brain surgery. If you just show up long enough, I'll call you a brain surgeon. Now, would you go to that doctor? Mm -mm. But you know what the church is? We have no attendance requirements. We don't even check if people bring their textbooks. And most of them have never done any of this we're talking about. They just sit and take in the lectures. Titus was told that's not God's plan. God's plan is not like my classes I used to go to at Michigan State University with 500 kids sitting in an amphitheater listening to this animated professor talk about something we didn't even understand. God is into the hands-on kind of work experience program. And that we're all supposed to be working through life and modeling this truth to someone else and living it ourselves, But not just living it in a vacuum, living it in the context of someone else. So, that's the introduction to Titus chapter 2. Let's stand together and I'm going to read these five verses before we go. And uh, we're going to learn another point of what we're supposed to live out. Titus chapter 2, I'm going to just read the first four verses. But as for you... Remember, this is Paul talking to Titus. Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Verse 2. And he starts successively talking about the four groups of people that make up the church. The older men, the older women, the younger men, the younger women. Okay? Verse 2 are the older men. That the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, sound in love, sound in patience. So those are the six qualities God wants in every older man. Verse 3. That the older women, likewise... That they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, and that they admonish the young women. So there are the qualities there that, that include that admonishing the young women in verse 4. Now the third group is in verse 4. It's the young women. And that's where we are this morning. And the young women, it starts in verse 4, have a number one priority. We looked at it last week. And it was one word. And in English, it's translated into four to love their husbands. And as we saw last week, every married woman in her lifetime, if she's a believer, should have another woman come alongside of her and say, how are you doing at loving your husband? Does he feel your love? That's what we talked about last week. Secondly, every mother should have an older woman who has had children, who knows God's word, come to her and say, how are you doing at loving your children? To love their children, four words. It's one word in Greek. Philotechnos. It's one word. It means a woman who communicates love to her children on the channel that they receive, in the words that they can understand, in the way that they can feel. That's what God says is the number Two priority for every woman that's married and has children. It's higher than most other things in life. It's an amazing truth. And then it goes on with a lot of other priorities that start in verse 5. We won't cover this morning. Let's bow forward a prayer. Father, I thank you that with your word open before us, we can look at your method. The method that causes your message to go out into this world. We have a mission in life. And that is to please you in everything we do, and specifically this morning, to please you as godly women who are mothers, who have children, to have as our very next priority after our mission to love our husband is our mission to love our children with a love that they can feel and that they can sense and that they understand and hear. And I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to this truth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, think about God's plan. I mean, it, it kind of reminds me, in World War II, there were a lot of ideas about how to win the war. And, and some of them were presented when they first were heard. It sounded crazy. Can you imagine how Paul 
God, you know, God says, okay, Paul, this is how you're going to turn the pagan Roman world around. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to train up this army of individuals, and what they're going to do is they are going to focus on these 24 character qualities. Paul said, really? He says, I thought that the meth was going to be, they're all going to be like me, and they're all going to be in jail all the time and preaching, getting scourged and bleeding and getting stoned. God said, no, no, you are special, Paul. All the rest of them are going to live this life that looks impossible to all the pagans. And the pagans are going to be like this, looking over the seats of life and say, what are you doing? Why? And in that context, they're going to get a brief moment to share Christ. And so he says, what you're going to do is you're going to prepare Christ church for the great social challenges and family pressures by saying that there is a way for you to model Christ in the world. And it starts in your homes and in your marriages and in your families. Because most of us spend most of our life in everyday life. We don't spend it chasing Greek words and parsing them and looking for the tense of the, of the root stem of the Hebrew radicals. It's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're, we're buying gas and we're in the grocery store and we're, we're mowing our lawn and talking to our neighbors. And in those contexts is the most powerful witness for Christ. Not just lifestyle. Message, remember. Proclaim the message. But the platform often is the lifestyle. And that's what Paul was telling them. Well, mothers who are in partnership with God are lovers of their children. And godly mothers who are in step with the Spirit, who is partnering with them and strengthening them, allow God's Spirit to energize them by His grace to be lovers of their children. And the character quality, the second one in verse 4, that God seeks in godly moms, is captured on paper with only one word, philotechnos. And this means to be the lover with love that can be felt. And by the way, this, this word is used of Jesus Christ in three of his relationships. Jesus Christ, it says in chapter 11 of John's Gospel, that he had this kind of phileo love for Lazarus. Remember, the people around says, oh, he really loved Lazarus. It wasn't that he agape sacrificially loved him. They knew that Jesus spent time with Lazarus. See, this love of friendship causes you to want to be around the person. Jesus would be trekking down on one of his journeys, and all of a sudden he'd slip over to, to Bethany to be with his friend. I mean, he wasn't just preaching to him. He just loved being around Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were his friends, but especially Lazarus was his friend. So... Jesus has this kind of love for Lazarus. This is also the word that's used in the Gospel of John for Jesus' love for the Apostle John. Remember, John was known as the disciple whom Jesus, what? Loved. Only it's not agape love. It's phileo love. Jesus was a close, intimate friend with John. In fact, when Jesus was going to something special... Like when Jesus went into the inner room to raise the little girl from the dead, he didn't bring all 12 of them in. You don't have the same level of friendship with people. Jesus brought Peter, James, and John. But among those three close friends, one was the closest. And when Peter wanted to know what Jesus was up to, he looked over at John and he says, hey, find out who he's talking about that's going to betray him. Why did Peter ask John that? Because John was his friend. By the way, this word is also used in Revelation 3.19, this phileo love, describing Christ's love for true saints in his church. So Jesus demonstrated his love to Lazarus, and everyone who saw that friendship knew how close they were. By the way, Lazarus could feel that Jesus loved him and was his friend. Jesus didn't just think this and let Lazarus fill in the pieces, you know, and the empty spaces. Jesus communicated it, and Lazarus knew it, and John knew it. John said, In fact, that's John's description of himself. The Apostle John says, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. (laughs) He knew it. Can you imagine the power that it is in a child's life if they go through life knowing that I'm the child my parents love? Did you know at various times in our eight children, all of them have been convinced that they're my favorite? Because I've told all of them. I get them alone and I say, I want to tell you something. It's hard to be away from her, but you might have to crowd into a closet somewhere. And, you know, so no one here, I say, I just want you to know something. You're my favorite of all the kids. You are. 
don't tell them, though, they'll get jealous. I won't. You know, they all think they're the favorite. Did you know we are supposed to communicate that, that love and that, that desire to, to be their friend? And Jesus did that. The same is seen when Jesus said to the church in Ephesus in 319, he, I mean, in, in Revelation 319 to the church in Philadelphia, how much he loved them, how much he wanted to commune with them. And in Laodicea, he says, I want to come and sup with you. He says, you're my friends and I'm coming to you as a church and I want to minister to you and love you. Well, we should give the priceless gift of love to our children. Do your loved ones in your family feel your love? Many husbands don't think that their wives admire them and love them. In fact, many husbands think their wives admire and love other men more than them, especially because their wives say to them, how come you're not like so-and-so's husband? They're always doing that for their kids. They're always doing that for their wife. And immediately that husband feels like, so you don't like what I do. And many wives... They feel that their husbands think other women are either better at caring for their husbands or prettier or better at caring. And those women don't feel the love and devotion of their husbands. And many children suffer because they, rather than feeling the love and closeness of their parents, they struggle with with their schoolwork and they see their parents gloating over their brother or sister's straight A's and kind of saying nothing about their bad grades. Have you ever thought about the fact that some of the most brilliant people in the world weren't very good in school? Remember Albert Einstein flunked everything. Why? He had this idea that if it was already in a book, he didn't want to learn it because it was already in a book. Why learn it? He wanted to learn new stuff that wasn't in books. Boy, that's a novel idea. Aren't you glad he did it? We wouldn't have any atomic bombs if he hadn't, you know. Uh, but, but think about it. Think about it. A lot of them did not do well in school. Uh, from Edison to, to Walt Disney to right. Steve Jobs with Apple Computer, if you have an iPhone or an iPod. I mean, that guy was a dropout. He was in a soup kitchen in in the San Francisco area getting free food and taking free classes for freeloaders. That was him. And he took a calligraphy class. You got to listen to his address to Stanford University. It just makes you cry how how brilliant that that mind is. And he as he was doing his calligraphy, he thought, wouldn't it be nice if everybody could write this way? And he said, well, maybe I'll make a computer where people can do letters in calligraphy instead of it all looking like a typewriter. And that's how the Apple computer was born. It's amazing to think about how we, we think that this is the only way to measure greatness. And God has given such giftedness that we should be careful to communicate to our children how unique and special they are. Well, you say, this sounds like a lot of psychology to me. Well, we have exactly a couple of minutes, okay, to look at how biblical this is. So go to 1 Timothy. You're in Titus. Back up to 1 Timothy. And I want to show you, I want to show you how biblical love that can be felt truly is in the Scriptures. Because Paul, in 1 Timothy, starting in chapter 1 and verse 2, cultivated this type of love that can be felt with a needy young man named Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1-2, we meet the mighty pastor of the church at Ephesus, but this mighty pastor was also a young man who had many physical and emotional needs. And Paul nurtured this, what he called my son, his child, in the faith, with a love that Timothy could see and feel. That means Paul loved his son Timothy, and Timothy knew it. How do you know it? By the way Paul acted toward him, by the way Paul talked to him, and by the way Paul talked about him to others. All of those are dimensions of how we show our love. Paul loved his son. His love was expressed through the powerful encouragement of affirmation. And in 1 Timothy 1, Paul explained to Timothy, starting in the second verse, what he thought of him. Now, just that he said all this, by the way, you're reading it. That means it was public. Paul didn't hide this. He didn't make Timothy scratch his head and wonder, what do wonder if Paul really thinks about me? He wrote it down. He had it read to Timothy. This letter would have been read out loud. It's amazing to think about. Well, first, Paul, in verse 2, told Timothy publicly that he was a gift from God to his life. Timothy was a true son. He said to Timothy, a true son in the faith. He said, you're a gift from God. In God's great plan, in in the great work of salvation, you're a true son. Now, what he could have said is, Timothy, you're a believer. 
and just you know kind of gave the cold facts of salvation. But he said, more than a believer, Timothy, you're a true son to me. Remember, Paul didn't have children. Remember, Paul didn't have, well, he had a family because his nephew helped him when he was in jail in Jerusalem. We read that in Acts. But Paul didn't have a normal family, wife, and children. And so he said, you're my true son. You're the one that, that ministers to me. You are a blessing in my life, Timothy. But he didn't stop there. Look at chapter 4. And, and the theology of Paul's nurturing ministry is so big, I'm just jumping over. It's kind of like we're going from mountaintop to mountaintop. But Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, that his life was deeply useful to God as an example to the flock. Can you imagine how Timothy felt when Paul said, your life, look at verse 12. He says, let no one despise your youth, Timothy. You're a young guy and you've got all these problems, but don't let them look down on you because you are an example to the believers in, in word and what you say and what you do in your love. And, and he just goes through this list. Can you imagine how Timothy felt? Now, Paul could have thought that all day long, but it didn't really impact Timothy till Paul, what? Said it to him. He says, wow, your life is deeply useful to God. Look at verse 14. Paul told him that there was a unique and divine calling on his life because he had a gift. And he wasn't blowing smoke. He says, every child of God, every one of us have a a unique fingerprint, a, a spiritual we're like spiritual snowflakes. No two of us are the same. God blends together His gifts and His calling to make us this uniquely gifted tool in His hands to accomplish His purposes, Acts 13.22, in our generation. So Paul told him in, in verse 14 of chapter 4 that he was unique. He had a divine calling in his life. And, and Paul says, don't neglect the gift that's in you. You've got it. It was given to you by the prophetic laying on of hands of the elders. And, and he says later, in 2 Timothy 1.6, that he needed to stir that gift up. Because, see, Timothy was one of these perpetual, discouraged, you know, cried and, and weak. And, you know, it, it's just so interesting how, how Paul encouraged him. Keep going to uh, chapter 5, verse 23. Paul was also, fourthly, very careful to never belittle Timothy for his weaknesses. Look what it says in verse 23. He says, hey, Timothy, don't just drink bottled water anymore. Put a little medicine in it for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Do you know what Paul didn't say? Buck up, man. Suck it in. Be tough. Be like me. Go get beat up in the jail. No, no, no. He says, hey, Timothy, you're a little, a little weaker. Put a little medicine in your water. You're sick a lot. Paul didn't say go out and run the arena and let the lions chase you. You know, he didn't, he didn't try and put him in impossible situations. He had frequent infirmities, and Paul never belittled Timothy for his weaknesses. Think about that. Think about how sarcastic, how easy it is to point out people, and in this context, children's weaknesses. Paul didn't do that. He never belittled Timothy for his weaknesses. In fact, 2 Timothy 1.4 says that he has frequent tears And Paul said, I'm greatly desiring to see you. Be mindful of your tears that I might be filled with joy. He says, I love you the way you are. And I can't wait to see you just like you are. I'm not trying to make you into something you're not. You're not like me. I want you to be who you are, who God made you to be. Another thing Paul said to him, look at chapter 6, verse 20 of 1 Timothy. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.20 that he had a treasure entrusted to him. He says, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid profane and idle babblings and contradictions falsely called knowledge. He says, don't stop. Hold on tight to what God gave you. You, You're a treasure. You've got the gospel. You're like a soldier guarding that. Make sure you fulfill your calling. You're gifted. If you keep going to 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul also reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, they had an incredible spiritual heritage. He says, remember, you've known this since you were a child. Verse 15 says, and that from childhood, you've known the Holy Scriptures. He was encouraging him about his upbringing. He says, you have a great rich heritage. You have a faith that your grandparent, your grandmother had, Lois and your mother Eunice, and, and now you've got it. And, and he just reminded him of that, that heritage spiritually had. And then, I love how Paul ends. Look at 2 Timothy 
chapter four and verse eight. He said this. He says to Timothy, you know what? God's really going to use you. Now, think about that. Think about how it must have encouraged Timothy that as Paul was waning and, and was actually in death row, in prison, awaiting execution, Paul says, Timothy, you know, my time's trying to close, but your time's just beginning. God's going to really use you. And this is what he says in 2 Timothy 4 8. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. But not just to me, but to all that love disappearing. Timothy, God's going to reward you. So Paul demonstrates how to love a child in the faith in a manner that love can be felt. Paul shows how to love someone with love of affirmation. He affirmed Timothy. He used tender and encouraging words to help Timothy. He exhorted him in his struggles. Do you know what that tells me? And by the way, this is just one small snapshot. You can see this sprinkled all the way through the way Paul dealt with those that he was nurturing. you know what it tells me? Titus 2.4 says that we need to practice ways. Last week, to love our husbands in a way they can feel. This week, to love our children in ways that they can feel. Make sure your loved ones feel your love. To help them receive and be touched by your love, there are several key ingredients. And Paul gives us all of them. Let me, I'm just going to read one. And next week we're going to talk. Next week's going to be the practical session. You know, how to practically love your husband. How to practically love your children. Well, let me just read these to you, okay? Godly moms who partner with God in raising their children love their children in a way that can be felt when they prepare special words for them. Now think about Paul. Paul is old. He's been beaten so many times. He really has arthritis and every other pain. And he hunches over a writing table and he thoughtfully, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, pens personal special words to affirm and encourage this child in the faith. Paul, and like Paul, we should use tender and encouraging words to help our children. Like Paul, we should never belittle our children for their weaknesses and tears. We should always remember that hugs are never enough. We need to tell our children how we feel about them. And those who are left to fill in the blanks often will feel worthless and insecure. At best, only confusion can come from silence. Far too many of us are really not that encouraging. It's not that we have a critical spirit. It's just that we don't say anything. And our loved ones are not mind readers. We can do better than just expecting them to know that we're in their corner are loving and admiring them silently. They need to hear it. And mothers who are in partnership with God in raising their children make an effort to catch those children doing something good, something right, something thoughtful, something considerate, something that's been well done, and they point it out and highlight it. Kind of like you see your child pick up some trash and put it in the trash can, you go, oh, Wow, that is so good. Out of the 50 million pieces of trash on the floor, you picked one up and put it in the trash. Good job. They'll go, wow. They'll pick another one up just to see if you'll say something. And those words are words of encouragement. You know, just to close, I'll tell you, yesterday I spoke at the commencement that I spoke at, and I was telling them commencement means the beginning, but I said also commencement marks the end of something. I said, for all of you parents sitting out here, this is kind of like the formal ending to your close-up parenting of these children. Now, you go through life, you're the parent, they're your child. When they come to Christ, you're your brother and sister. But I told them that the biggest responsibility that God says that you are to have with your children is that you become best friends with them. As you'll see in the rest of these qualities, that, that if you become this kind of loving friend, you'll know how to pray for them because they share their life with you. You'll know how to encourage them because they'll share their weaknesses with you. You know how to affirm them because they will share with you their, their deepest, inmost secrets and goals. 
But I was watching the graduation. After I got done speaking, I went down and sat with my family, and I looked up on the stage, and they were coming. And it was a, a, the largest homeschool group in, in Tulsa, and, and there are hundreds of homeschooling families. And so all these parents were coming and presenting their diplomas. And do you know what? They would present the, right in the center stage, and everybody was watching. They present the diploma, and then they were supposed to somehow show their affection to their child. And you know what you could tell? The parents would never practice closeness and warmth and love with their children because they hand them that diploma and they kind of went, you know, it's like hugging a cactus. They didn't know quite how to do it. You know, it was like, uh, you know, you weren't sure what they were doing, if they were just hitting with their pads like in football or what, because they had never cultivated a close, loving, nurturing, affectionate Both sides, you could see there was a little something that this is foreign to me. Remember, God will never judge you on how your children turn out. But he will look you in the eye and say, did you raise them the way I told you to? Loving them in a way they could feel so that you could be lifelong best friends, sharing their burdens, encouraging them so that like Paul, at the end of your life, you can say, you know what? I'm not going to be here much longer, but you're going to do great things for God. That's love that can be felt. Let's all stand for a closing word of prayer and commit ourselves to be specifically godly moms in partnership with God that love our children in ways they can feel. But in a wider sense, for all of us to say, God, I know what my mission is. I want to please you, whatever I'm doing. I know I got this message, I'm speaking, but I'm going to follow your method. And I'm going to either teach someone else or go to someone and say, i got a lot to learn. Can you just kind of help me and follow God's method? Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, thank you that we can be in partnership. Your grace can energize us and we can be pleasing you. And Lord, I pray that whatever we do when we go out of here, that we'll do it in such a way that will fulfill our mission to please you. And may we nurture and practice loving those around us in our family, in our marriage, in our home with love that can be felt. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You should go.